every minute of every day, people all across the globe are recording the jaw-dropping and the life-saving. Oh, my God, get back! and the unbelievable. Well, there's a baby underneath the car. Seeing a baby under the car was like seeing my own daughter under the car. And while footage is being shared online more than ever, we're meeting the people who've captured these once-in-a-lifetime moments. I knew that we were in trouble. I wonder if I'm going to fall into the slipstream of the aircraft. To get the story behind the footage. Who's this? Once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. There's some bird. In my car. From death-defying escapes... Stop! I started to panic. Ah! I thought I was going to die. Ah! And incredible life-changing acts... Oh, I was still shaking for quite a while. The adrenaline was still popping. I had never flown with Dan before. To heartwarming surprises. And he just asked me to marry him. And uncontrollable acts of nature. I've got... 15 minutes max before I lose question. These are the moments you'd never believe if they weren't caught on camera. Coming up in the show, clinging on for dear life the climber who experienced an avalanche of emotions on an icy rock face. And out of nowhere, this avalanche hit me. I was scared out of my mind. I ran down to where it was at, immediately went into the water. When a training exercise turned into a real-life emergency... If you believe in a power above or fate or whatever, Something shined upon this man, and it was not his time. And the story of a farming couple's attempt to save their flock will send shivers down your spine. Where are they going to be? What are you going to find? Are they going to be OK? Out-of-control vehicles are very bad news, and not just when the weather conditions are treacherous. What seemed like an ordinary working day for these employees of a veterinary surgery in North Carolina turned out to be anything but when this happened. The female employee miraculously escaped unharmed. This video shows the frightening moment a tractor trailer plows off a bridge and into an icy cold river in Boston. In true action movie style, the unharmed driver scrambled out of his cab and onto the roof, where he waited nearly an hour for assistance. Get ready for some genuine car crash TV. Luckily, this man and his daughter from Louisiana avoided serious injury, but there was no saving his no claims bonus. And as the driver gets out to check everyone's OK, his self-help tape can be heard still playing in the background. When you are impeccable, you take responsibility for action. To New York now and the city of Yonkers, where police officers Paul Samoyedny and Rocco Fusco had to do more than just issue tickets for this bad driving. Uh, my grandfather was a New York City police officer. I always looked up to him, so I kind of wanted to follow his footsteps. And also, I, I, I enjoy interacting with people and getting to know people. Some days are stressful, some days are carefree, and you just gotta learn to, you know, deal with the punches as they roll. We'll handle domestics, we'll handle robberies, we'll handle loud noise complaints. It varies from one end of the spectrum to the other. You usually don't get to work with Rocco very often in the same car. We were riding together that day, probably the first time in a while, and we were just looking forward to getting a nice breakfast. I had my heart set on pancakes and bacon that morning. No sooner had they placed their breakfast orders when they suddenly felt the building vibrate. Outside on a street busy with morning commuters, a man had lost control of his vehicle. He came around the corner, he hit a car across the street from us. As he careered into a shop opposite, CCTV cameras captured a shocking and distressing scene. He then bounced off of that car, hit the woman and her child who was crossing the street, and went right through the storefront of the barbershop with them on the hood. Is there anybody in there? Yeah. Somebody started saying that there's a woman in there. I went to the front of the car, discovered that there was a woman hit, 
People at that time started yelling, baby, something about a baby. I wasn't sure if she was pregnant or if there was a baby somewhere. Um, I, I actually asked her, are you pregnant or you, you have to She was in a state of shock, understandably, and she started pointing underneath the car, which is when we realized that there was a little infant underneath the car. Oh, there's a baby underneath the car. Yeah, OK. Seeing the baby under the car was like seeing my own daughter under the car. Me and Rocker were trying to decide what to do. There was probably a six inch gap between the fender and the actual car. I could actually see the baby trying to crawl towards her mom. At that point, we decided we weren't going to be able to move the car. So we're going to have to try and lift it up. Come on, come on, kid. Come on. Grab, grab. And as we started going, Rock was like, somebody has to grab the baby. We were trying to get the mother to grab the baby, but unfortunately, she was so out of it and with her own injuries that she couldn't concentrate what was going on. So then I came around, I cleared a path, and I went under as they lifted up to pull the baby out. Grab the baby. Everybody did something to help. Uh, somebody t was able to turn the car off. Other people came over to try to help us actually physically lift the car off the baby. I had other gentlemen taking debris out of the wall. Because with the mom, we were worried about the debris falling on top of her. At that point, you're just trying to keep her calm. All right, Hold on, OK? Sometimes the worst injuries are the ones you can't see. Uh, we don't want to move her. We just wanted to get a backboard, neck brace, and get, get her proper medical attention. Somebody's got to pull the baby. Oh, got to pull them out. Kind of went in slow motion. You didn't realize. At the time, you're just trying to process everything and do what you can to help. We were able to get the baby out, and the baby was in one piece, and crying, and I've never been so happy to hear crying baby. At the time, we were just happy that the baby was crying, breathing, and, and all in one piece. Oh, I remember handing the baby off to the father, and then it was kind of like a sense of relief. Is this your baby? Hold her till the end comes, okay? She was covered in motor oil. At the time, we weren't sure if it was blood, bodily fluid, what, what it was. You could see she had burns all over her body. Behind the leg, too, okay? Just be careful. There might be glass in it. As well as burns, the eight-month-old baby suffered a fractured skull. Her mum was rescued minutes later when the fire department arrived on scene. Her leg was badly broken. After we got them to safety, somebody had uh, brought over some gallons of water from the store and uh, kind of washed off my hands and my arms as they were covered in motor oil. It wasn't me, it was the baby when I grabbed her. And I kind of just asked Rocco if he was OK, and we were both kind of like, it just just really happened. Baby was okay. okay. Baby was okay. <laughs> we lifted the car up. It kind of puts things in in perspective. Um, life could change in an instant. They were going to the beach that day, and uh, their life changed in a second. And as for the driver, the driver pled guilty to driving under the influence, and he's been sentenced to two and a half years to seven and a half years in state prison. Four months later, both mom and baby were well enough to be reunited with the officers who helped to save their lives. Back in uh, November, the day before Thanksgiving, we had a, a little press conference with a reunion with mom and baby. It was right before the baby's first birthday. It was nice to see that everybody was up and OK and it was just in good health. It was very nice. Videos of the incident from the CCTV and the officers' body cameras soon created a lot of online traffic. It's uh, kind of overwhelming, the publicity it's received, and just, you know, the amount of people that want to talk to you about it and ask you questions about it, it's, it's really no other word to describe it. And everybody's always kind of pointing and squinting their eyes, like, oh, you're the guy. You saved the baby. And that, that's always a nice feeling. I'm very proud. The police officers all over the country that do the same thing every single day. Um, Paul and I said before, we're not special. We just happen to be in the right place at the right time. I was just glad that we were there and mom and, and child are okay now and that it was really a community that came together and helped rescue that child. It wasn't just me and Officer Fusco, but every, everybody around the area. Coming up. We had to act really quickly on this matter. Sea turtles move slowly, but speed was of the essence when trying to save this much-loved specimen. The danger is that she could swallow the net, and this could get completely stuck in her digestive tract. 
And this adrenaline junkie keeps a cool head under a sea of snow. I was, you know, shaking and freaked out, and I knew if I didn't get that under control, I would probably die. Ever wonder how they measure horsepower? Simple, they race a horse, of course, like this biker. There were long faces all round in this Dutch suburb when a horse bolted from its owner and broke free. Luckily, a passing biker came to the rescue. Eventually, our two-wheeled horse whisperer talked some sense into the equine escapee and won by a nose in this photo finish. Cops tackling crime on the mean streets of Wales? Actually, on this occasion, they're rescuing a playful deer trapped in a child's rope swing. It's okay. The poor animal is not coming quietly, so the police use all their negotiating techniques to get the beast to cooperate, a kind of good cop, good cop approach, eventually releasing it without charge. And here in California, this animal rescue takes a much more dramatic turn. After a man unwisely races into his burning home to save his dog. The fire crew are shocked but relieved when the man and his pet dog finally escape. All right, all right, all right. Oh. Thankfully, with just minor burns. Time to cool off with a trip to the sea now for some expert animal rescue on the island of Kefalonia in Greece. I'm Anya McKenzie. I've always been fascinated by the sea and marine organisms, which led me to wanting to study marine biology at university. And I have been living in Greece for the last four years, and I work on a sea turtle conservation project. Here in Kefalonia, a team of experts and volunteers work to monitor and support the indigenous sea turtle population whose habitat is constantly under threat from global warming, tourism, and the many local fishing boats and their nets. And during one of the team's regular research missions, they spotted Tilly, a turtle they knew well. But she appeared to be in trouble. Yeah, it's coming out of the right side of the beach, right side of the corner. So we know immediately that this is a turtle in need. Okay. Tilly had what appeared to be a plastic fishing net trapped in her mouth. And we had to act really quickly on this matter. The danger is that she could swallow the net and this could get completely stuck in her digestive tract. Yeah, it's going straight back through. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can see it going. Yeah, yeah. Which would be a huge problem. That's a good one. And as we looked closer, we saw a hook and a net entangled in a line, which also had a hook in it. The hook had got stuck in her throat area, and this meant that the net couldn't be ingested, nor could it come out comfortably or easily. Where's the hook? It's in there. OK. It's here. There's one right here. Where? Like, sticking upwards. With the problem identified... Can we get the, that light that's in there? There was now just the small matter of keeping her jaws open long enough to remove it. She's got to go there. She's... So a loggerhead sea turtle, they have such a big crushing force in their beak. They could take your fingers off, no problem. Just watch your hand. I need you to watch your hand, so you're going to go up here, just like that. Yep. There's always a sense of fear. You know you have to do things very carefully and with precision. If you're putting down some pliers down to where the hook is in the throat. You don't want to grab a pinch of bit of skin. OK, you ready? Yeah. <laughs> Finally, they managed to remove the sharp fishing hook embedded in Tilly's throat. We then have another problem, which is the net. The net is still lodged in her throat, and we don't really know what's going on with this net. You can see it right now, you can see it. Yes. Is she really ingested it? Is it down to her stomach, or is it just a short piece? Or there's another hook attached to the end. Oh, great. So we slowly, slowly started to pull the net from the turtle's throat. Can you, is, it, is it quite easy to get the net it, It's a very delicate, delicate procedure, this. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's like a... I just can't lose that grip. 
because then I, I'm going to be all up in there. <laughs> Thank you. We couldn't believe it. We got all of the net out, and at the end of the net, there's a huge ball of fish. It was the best feeling. Being able to take that net out successfully, being able to take the hook out successfully, it was the most incredible thing, knowing that we have saved that sea turtle. OK, girl. OK, there we go. And Tilly's rescue in particular, because it was just, it was something so different to what we were used to. We don't get a net and a hook together, usually. You really feel for the turtles. You really feel for Tilly and the fact that the reason that she got into this mess was because of things that we do. Fishing is a huge problem to sea turtles, and it's really difficult to deal with. But because we had that situation caught on film, it meant that we were able to put it out there. And that creates awareness. That allows people to understand the things that we're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. And, you know, we're just one small project on the island of Kefalonia in Greece. So I'm really grateful for the fact that lots of people have seen this video around the world. When it comes to extreme sports, the clue is in the name. This Frenchman is using a new high-powered jetpack. While it might look futuristic, it's about to get very basic. He uncontrollably spins in the air, and it's all downhill after that. And the lesson happening here is a jet ski can be a lot of fun. But if the fun is pushed too far... It can be a knockout you never anticipated. And without the help of this handy body cam, may never have even remembered. Thankfully, once his headache, this man recovered enough to post his knockout video online. And finally, jumping off cliffs is not everyone's idea of a safe, healthy pursuit, but if you're going to do it, at the very least, fasten your helmet. And from beautiful British cliffs to the cool Colorado mountains. And a high altitude adventure with climbing instructor Leland Miski, a man with a head for extreme heights and hats. Most of my big climbing objectives kind of revolve around me climbing alone on like icy or alpine terrain. I lose myself into the calmness, the aloneness, the the sheer unbridled joy of it all. It's one of the things that makes me the happiest in the world. In February 2022, that unbridled joy would turn to terror on a solo climb to the peak of a Colorado mountain range called the Ribbon. I'd always wanted to do it. The weather was pristine that day. It was minimal to no winds. It was a beautiful, sunny day. The avalanche conditions were very, very low. It was honestly a very perfect day to be out there. And if you're going to solo climb the ribbon, you want proof, meaning Leland captured his whole ascent on camera. I use a 360-degree camera, and it's this small, awesome little action camera. I put it on a selfie stick that sticks out of my backpack, but it gets really sweet shots, <laughs> so it's super worth it. And while he was planning to show people his film when he got back, he failed to tell anyone about his climb beforehand. I did not actually tell anyone I was going to go do this climb. I just went out there because I just thought it'd be a quick climb. I got on it. It was dreamy, just like really enjoyable. And then I got on the ice above, and it's like uniform shimmering ice, what we call hero ice. It's like climbing a giant wall made of plastic. One hit, swings, and beautiful sticks. Um, just like really, really fun and amazing climbing. Leading up to it, everything before that moment was probably the best climb that I'd done all winter. But at 400 feet, just before the peak of his climb, disaster struck. And out of nowhere, this avalanche hit. I was scared out of my mind. There's no ropes, I wasn't attached to anything. 
only way that I was connected to the wall was my two ice tools and my crampons. I was, you know, shaking and freaked out, and I knew if I didn't get that under control, I would probably die. Alone, with nothing to catch his fall and no one knowing his whereabouts, the only option left was to cling on for dear life. And I was wildly and emotionally hitting, trying to get my tool into the wall with this giant weight of snow, not only pushing me down, but deflecting my tool off the ice. Any time that I would get close to it, the snow would kind of push it away. I managed to get one really, really super good stick in the ice. And then I just kind of tuckered down. It pushed me to the absolute brink of what I could hold on to. Frozen and terrified of what may come next, as soon as there was a lull, Leland took his chance to escape. So I was able to like down climb around it and go down 20 feet. And then I just hooked myself to the anchor and just immediate wave of calm. And I, that's kind of when I started allowing myself to think again of like, oh, this just happened. Holy crap, that was crazy. What am I going to do? OK, hold it together, Leland. You still need to get out of here. The whole perception of time gets really funky when you're in a situation like that. It felt like forever, but at the same time, it felt really fast. When I watched the video afterwards, I realized it lasted for about two to three minutes. With the whole dramatic climb caught on camera, as soon as Leland posted it online, the likes started climbing too. And before long, his brush with death had been seen by millions. I put it on Instagram, and then it just exploded. Um, and now it's been viewed 19.9 million times, which is pretty nutty. I will continue to climb, and I will continue to solo, and I will continue to do all these things. I'm using this experience as a wonderful learning opportunity in order to move forward, and in order to climb better, and in order to climb safer in the backcountry when I'm, when I'm by myself. Coming up. I wasn't able to open the door. A humble training video becomes a hard-hitting documentary. And this paraglider has some quick thinking to do when she loses control at 6,000 feet. The glider lost energy, so I just, yeah, fell into the canopy. There are many dangers in life, but none quite as quick, as powerful, or as deadly as fast-moving water. Over in Sydney, Australia, when a lagoon next to Long Reef Beach burst its banks, an elderly man trying to cross the raging waters to get back to his car found himself swept away by the current. A drone camera filming surfers captured the moment they spotted him and battled the raging waters to drag him unharmed back to safety. Here in Brisbane, Huge storms swelling the local river have unmoored a nearby houseboat and its 70-year-old occupant. As it raced untethered towards a nearby ferry terminal, the owner managed a last-minute escape and was saved by emergency services who had been tracking the boat, which very quickly capsized. And over in Western Australia, a father and his two young sons were found by police trapped in a desperate situation miles out at sea. The police vessel has just arrived on scene. A freak wave had capsized their boat and left them clinging to the hull for 90 minutes before they were able to retrieve a radio and raise the alarm. Fortunately, the three of them suffered only mild hypothermia. And made a full recovery. To Maryland, USA now, for another dramatic rescue on water. Or is it? The rescue happening here is in fact a training exercise, revealing the work of the local emergency services volunteers. So absolutely nothing to worry about here, right? I'm Martin Walsh. I lead the hive team for the Susquehanna Host Company. None of us are paid. We're all volunteers. It is not my regular job. I do IT work as what pays the bills and everything else. So this is only work that takes place in my free time. 
We are located at Tidings Park Marina, which is owned by the city of Havity Grace. It's classic small town. It's very close knit. Everybody cares about everybody else. We were out here filming a uh, simulated rescue as part of an effort to increase our recruitment and get more volunteers out to give us a hand. We had a kayak with a mannequin floating, and it's a typical rescue for us to actually have to do. But with the film crew still on board, Marty's safety demonstration video suddenly switched to a dramatic real-life documentary and a full-on emergency. This was not a drill. Oh I ran down to where it was at, immediately went into the water. Car that just went off the uh, dock at City Park. A car with an elderly driver inside had inexplicably careered off the jetty and was sinking fast. The boat was able to reposition next to me. I had them get me a line. We immediately tied a line off to the passenger side rear axle so that we would never lose the vehicle. Okay, start being medic unit right now. Realized I had a single patient, elderly male. I wasn't able to open the door. Then the boat reposition was able to break the window out for me so that I could get a hold of him. The car was now filling with water, making this rescue attempt a terrifying race against time. I was able to grab a hold of the man. Oh, and I was able to support his weight as well as mine and swim over to the boat and get him loaded. Thankfully, as well as the dive team, the emergency medical technicians, the EMT, were also on board that day. When he got on the boat and the EMT tells me he didn't inhale any water, I'm like, I'm, ec I'm ecstatic. The patient says things like, I just got the pedals confused. By the time he was transferred to the ambulance, we had a very high probability of a positive outcome. The gentleman made a full recovery. But for a hero like Marty, work is never done. I stayed there and I ran command with my dive team that had recovered the vehicle to prevent the environmental damage to the bay. And later that day, after the footage is posted on the rescue service's social media sites, the remarkable work of these volunteers is seen around the world. It's interesting. I'm giving him the instructions and everything else, and you can I never noticed it until now. You see the man reaching across, trying to put the window down. Did I save his life? I was a piece of what saved his life. If I hadn't had the person to break the window out, if I hadn't had the EMT on board, if I hadn't had all the rest of the stuff, if you believe in a power above or fate or whatever, something shined upon this man and it was not his time. And he was very lucky. And we all need a little bit of luck now and again. This driver in Colorado is getting a speeding ticket, and his day is about to get even worse. Everyone do it, two, 233. Are you okay? Okay, I got help on the okay? Unbelievably, no major injuries were caused. When the roof of this blazing building collapsed onto the head of this Dallas firefighter, in seconds his colleagues had his back. Thankfully, the building was vacant with no one inside. After a short stay in hospital, the officer returned home. Now to Annecy in the French Alps, home to 20-year-old Maud Perrin, who needed more than luck on her side when her passion for paragliding turned into a perilous mid-air mix-up. So I've been flying now for six years. I started when I was 15 and I started acro paragliding a bit uh, later, so that's two years ago. Acro paragliding is an extreme version of paragliding, only with less gliding and more breathtaking mid-air maneuvers. It takes a lot of time and dedication. So when I go flying, I film when I do new tricks because that's the moment you do mistakes, usually, and you want to know what you do. In October 2021, Maud was on a training trip in Turkey. She was looking at a new technique called twisted infinity tumbling, which sounds very difficult and very terrifying, because it is. The first time it went OK, it was not 
perfect, but it was like not dangerous, like nothing happened. But her second jump didn't go as planned. When she attempted to uncross her cords, disaster struck. So I went for it, I pulled, I don't remember too late or too early, but on the wrong timing. So I, the, the glider lost energy. So I just, yeah, fell into the canopy. Six thousand feet in the air, and Maud was now hanging upside down and completely tangled in the lines of the glider. Only her rescue parachute could help her regain control, but that didn't go to plan either. So I pulled it and it got stuck. So I have a second reserve in case the first one doesn't open. So if that last rescue had failed, I had yeah, I would have probably hit the ground a bit. Like, faster because I had no parachute. Second time lucky. Maud was finally in control of her descent, but now had just seconds to brace herself for an epic splash landing. So it's safer to train over the water than over the ground because, uh, of course, it's softer to, to crash into the water than to crash on the ground. And I had time like to be like, OK, the water is coming. <laughs> Of course, if you if you stay too long in the in the water, the the water comes into the glider, and since it's a fluid, the glider just starts starts uh, flying, but like in the water, and it just pulls you down uh, till and yeah, you just sink. The rescue boat was quickly on the scene to scoop her out of the water, and once back on dry land, Maud posted the footage of her terrifying freefall on social media. <laughs> The video ended up online really fast. I just posted it maybe at the end of the day. Oh, my legs are still tangled until I'm in the boat. <laughs> I'm just like crawling into the boat. Two weeks later, Maud was back in the sky up to her mid-air tricks again. And this time it all went to plan. It didn't change my, my outlook on flying because it's something I know it can happen and it's fine. Since it's just cause, consequence, then you just, yeah, you don't do it again, and, and it's fine. You just learn, actually. <laughs> Once I try it again in NC, it all went well. Now I feel safe to train it over the ground, so it's, it's all good. Coming up, a co-pilot is forced to engage with a very unexpected situation. If controls remain unresponsive, proceed to force landing procedure okay. on uh, just, just, just stay calm. Oh my gosh, force landing? <laughs> I have to put down in a field? This is the moment a woman saw her six-year-old border collie falling from the bathroom window. Oh my God, get back! Oh my God! Oh my God! Her quick reflexes meant she caught the dog before it sustained any serious injuries. But it's not only animals of the cute variety we'll go the extra mile for. When this holiday maker in the Bahamas found a shark trapped near the beach, he bravely, some might say foolishly, went to its aid. It was quite the struggle. The shark couldn't wait to get back to open water, and the man couldn't wait to post his heroic encounter on social media. <laughs> Also saving an animal in need is this Tennessee farmer, where in another selfless act caught on camera, he's seen lowering himself into a sinkhole to rescue one of his young cows. <laughs> After much effort from both farmer and cow, and another hairy moment when it looked like the cow might fall down the same hole again, the animal eventually trotted off back to its herd. Poor baby. That story is hard to follow, but sheep are known for it, so it's back to the UK and the Peak District, where sheep farmers Nev and Kate Barker have a chilling tale to tell. We are on an uplands farm at just on the edge of the Peak District, at around 1,300 foot up. Pretty exposed area and quite remote. We've got rolling hills, we've got moorlands, we've got valleys, woodlands, reservoirs and lakes. We look after a small flock of Herdwick sheep. I would describe our Herdwicks as pets. They've got a story behind them of where they've come from, whether they're one of our child's lambs that they chose when they were babies, 
and they've named them and we've kept them on, bred from them for many, many years. In November 2021, Storm Arwen battered the UK with winds of up to 100 miles per hour. A huge snowfall was also forecast to drop on the Peak District overnight. As a breed, as a herd, we do not want to be kept inside. The night before the storm, made sure everything was right, uh, went to bed worrying about them. A night of worry was followed by a day of serious concern. The snowfall had been heavier than anticipated, putting the flock in danger. When you look out of the, the farmyard window, and there's a drift, and it's above your head, and then you see all the gateways are blocked. You just don't know where the sheep are going to be sheltered or where the snow is going to land. And that's your main thing and worry. Where are they going to be? What are you going to find? Are they going to be OK? There was only one way to find out, and it was going to be cold, windy and dangerous. The storm was still raging. It was still, um, you're struggling on your feet. You can go around one corner and it, it tries to whip you off your feet before you know where you are, really. It was, it was brutal out there, really. You were tugged up with so many layers on just to try and keep warm, because you, obviously you don't know how long you're going to be out there or what you're going to find. Nev and Kate discovered 26 out of their 42 beloved sheep were missing. After several hours searching their fields, the couple spotted a small hole in a snowdrift. To see the hole, you sort of straight away your hopes are up because there's a possibility that you found some of the sheep. You just dive straight in and start digging sideways in, deeper and deeper as you can until obviously you find the head's going to be first. Come on. Come on. They didn't want to come out because it was obviously was warm in there, but also as they're in there, the warmth off their bodies melts the snow and they can get frozen in as well, so they can't actually get out because the fleece does mat into the ice. They're always probably thinking, what are you going to do? Why, why are you helping me? Because normally when you're working with the sheep, you're either injecting them or putting something down the mouth or clipping their feet or and they're like, and what are you, you know, maybe they're thinking, what are you doing? After five hours in the freezing temperatures without a woolly fleece to keep them warm, Nev and Kate located all of the missing herd. And despite their apparent ingratitude, all the sheep were in good health. You're just exhausted, really. You've got to the point where you are emotionally exhausted as well, trying to find them, and you have found them. With the rescue mission completed, a thawed-out Kate posted the footage to her social media. The video picked up straight away as soon as it was uploaded. I must admit, it was, oh, well done, heroes. You know, look what these guys are doing to rescue their sheep. People might call us heroes or never hero, but it's just something that we do when you've got livestock. If it wants rescuing or it needs looking after our attention, it's part of your job. So, yeah, a hero in one way, but in our way, it's just what we do. No sheep down snow holes in this next clip. We're in the more arid climes of Australia now, where this remarkable display of sheep herding was captured on a drone camera. A farmer, unable to attend his aunt's funeral due to lockdown restrictions, sent this incredible message of love in the only way he knew how. It certainly beats a Zoom call for creativity. Over in Mexico, these tourists were having a whale of a time when this amorous humpback whale popped up looking for a quick smacker. Hello, senor whale. But now we're off to Texas, where they like to do things big. And in 2020, military pilot Dan Boog was planning to propose to his girlfriend Jenna but instead of getting down on one knee, decided on something a little more ambitious. I met Dan through um, an app called Bumble, and it was back in 2017. Jenna was uh, at Oklahoma University. I was studying health sciences, and he was doing his pilot training. The more time went on, the more I got to know him, the more I was like, wow, I really am falling in love with this guy. He's, he's different. Well, she helped me during pilot training. She helped me study a lot. I know I, I'm deployed a lot and gone a lot, and that's that's tough. But she's always she's always there. She's a sweetheart. 
two years after they met, he decided the time was right to pop the question. Well, for the proposal, I wanted to do something fun. The proposal was the epitome of Dan's personality because he, uh, I think that's where the military aspect came out because he's a planner. And Dan asked me if I wanted to go back home with him to uh, help harvest uh, with his family because they have a farm in South Dakota. Hey guys, we're out here getting the flags marked so I can leave a message in the field for Jenna. So once it was all harvested, we put flags down, taped everything off. My dad took a tractor out there with a, a piece of tillage equipment, and we made the message. It took about an hour per letter. <laughs> We're trying to get this message, and, and Jenna's calling me. She's like, where are you at? I'm like, hey, I can't be there right now. His sisters were like, let's have a girls' day. And now I know they were just trying to like distract me so that Dan could get the message done. Because pilot Dan had a question for Jenna so big, it had to be seen from above. We actually ran out of time. My, my dad and brother finished Jenna's name while I was getting the aircraft ready to go. So I'm glad everything was spelled right. Everything was good. I had never flown with Dan before. I told her, hey, I'll, I'll take you out um, to eat. We'll go fly somewhere, and uh, I'll, I'll bring my little sister. Laura was in the back seat. Are you feeling OK? Yeah. Yeah, are you? Yeah. It's still kind of a windy day, so that kind of contributed to kind of setting the stage for everything. Did I get any response out of the controls? I pretended to not have any response out of the, uh, one of the flight controls. What do you want me to do? Okay. Stay calm. It all seemed very plausible that we wouldn't be having response with the controls when something is wrong with the wing when it's really windy. Can you pull on that checklist? I uh, took a, a 172, a Cessna 172 checklist, the aircraft that we flew, and I put it in like a PDF editor, and I just changed some of the words. I helped Dan a lot with his pilot training, so I had done that several times. So I'm reading the checklist. And read off the steps to me. Verify flight rate. Engaged. OK. And I didn't really realize what I was reading. Ring engagement process. I was reading, like, ring process, initiate. Initiate. Engaged. OK, it's initiated. It did not cross my mind at all. Still not getting any response. Just hold on. I, I wanted to stay calm. I, I didn't want anyone to start screaming. He's like, OK, read about forced landing. If controls remain unresponsive, proceed to forced landing procedure okay. on all uh, just, just, just stay calm. Oh my gosh, forced landing? <laughs> like we have to put down in a field? I can't control it. I have to go put down the field. I kept reading. Will the pilot in command love the co-pilot forever? OK, Perfect. keep going. And it just was a complete switch, because I was like, oh my goodness, to Wait a second, I think something's going on here. Look over right wing. I look out to the right. <laughs> and that's where um, I see the message in the field, and it says, marry me, Jenna. Will you marry the pilot in command? Oh, my God. Oh, my goodness, this is really happening, and he just asked me to marry him. Yes. <laughs> that's when I started, like, getting choked up. It was a big day, an important moment. When we landed, it's like, my mom's going to freak out. I wish she were here. I knew it was going to be important to have her family there. It was a surprise. They were waiting when we got back, and that worked out perfect. And they were all holding signs, like, congratulations. And my dog was there, and it was so sweet. I felt so special. Soon after, Dan's military career would see the couple separated, but his epic proposal was still on his mind. I was actually deployed in Africa, I had some free time, and I put it on TikTok. Next thing I know, there's several hundred thousand views. It went viral on TikTok, it was on Facebook. So many people commenting. I think a lot of the comments are like, oh, no, she didn't have a choice. She was up in a plane. Like, she had to say yes. And it's like, of course I would say yes. He knew I would say yes. If she had said no, I didn't really have a plan. It was all or nothing <laughs> for me. A parachute would seem like the only option in the event of a no. But soon it was wedding pictures being posted online. We had our wedding in August 2021. And it was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is where I'm from. It was beautiful. Looking back, I feel 
amazed that he pulled off such a, you know, elaborate proposal. And I'm very impressed that he do something that was so special.